All right, so we're going to talk about hand planes. So a hand plane is a tool that's used to flatten wood. Uh, so if you ever look at most uh, you know, woodworking logos, a lot of times they'll have this on there because it's a cornerstone of woodworking. So to understand what a hand plane is, it is really nothing more than a chisel that is mounted in a block with the cutting edge down here. So the bevel here is on the bottom, the flat part here is on the top, and it just moves along and slices the wood. But to get more control over it, what you're going to do is mount it into a frame. And that frame is the metal body and the frog. So I've taken apart one of the planes here to show you all the different pieces. So we have the body, the frog, which is the part that the iron or the cutter mounts to. So the frog, in this case, this is a, a Bailey number no. four or old Stanley plane. So it's patented back in 1902 and 1910. So it's been around about 100 years, but it has two flat pieces here and here, which is what the frog mounts to. And it's held in place with uh, these two screws and washers. And most planes, uh, <clears throat> the, the, the art of plane making started, or at least metal plane making started back in the 1860s when Leonard Bailey patented his design that's still in use today. And this was really the, the that stuck around for nearly a hundred years in, in use. Uh, it died out right around, a little bit after World War II with the advent of power tools. And there just wasn't as big of a need for uh, planes to be used professionally. So uh, the frog mounts into the body like this. There is also the cutter, which has this slot, and this is the cutting edge. Um, the cutter, or the iron as it's called, mounts to what's called a chip breaker or cap iron that sits on top of the iron. So they mount together like this. So the iron on bottom, the cap iron, the chip breaker goes on top. And you can see it has a little bit of a hump here, so as it as the wood is cut, it hits this chip breaker and goes vertical so that you don't uh, split the wood. You're actually cutting the wood. And that's held in place with uh, a screw. And then there's also a uh, tote, which is the back handle, which mounts here, and a knob, which goes on the front. And then the iron is held in place with a um, cap iron, or a, a lever, lever cap. And then that holds the plane nice and solid. So when you're cutting with the plane, uh, this is a number two, so it's a little bit smaller. When it cuts, you can see the iron is just sticking out through here. So when you're adjusting the iron, there are two adjustments. There is the lateral adjustment, which is back here. And so as I'm moving this side to side, the iron angles this way. It has the effect of the cutting surface angling like this so that you can adjust it. You don't have to put it in there perfect because you've got that lateral adjustment which will make sure that the iron is straight across no matter how you mount it. It also has this brass adjustment knob which is backwards threaded so to get it to tighten you turn it clockwise. And what happens is this little horseshoe piece on the back has a part that sticks out here and as you turn it clockwise this starts moving down. Well that sits squarely in this little hole here on the uh, chip breaker and then to rotate it backwards you do it counterclockwise and this rotates back and so you can adjust the depth of the cut with that knob. So if I'm using this what I'll end up doing, use the bigger one here, um, is I use a three finger grip, hand on the, the knob, backhand on the tote, and then my middle finger as I'm planing, 
I can make the adjustment either raising the iron or lowering the iron. So the way that I always try to do it is raise the iron as much as you need to and then start lowering it because there's play in the screw. So you get hysteresis in the threads and you always want to be lowering the iron so that you get a, a consistent turn. So you might do it maybe an eighth of a turn at a time and then plane. So as you're planing, you can make a pass, adjust on the backstroke, and keep going forward until you get the right thickness of cut that you want. So the way to adjust, you can see that the throat is open, so you can see through it. So if you hold it at about 45 degrees and sight directly down the sole, the light from above will hit the edge, which is the sharp part. And as you turn that knob and get it coming out, you'll start to see a sliver of light. And that's your starting point. So that's when you know you're probably not going to cut anything, but at least you know that it is ready and close so that when you start planing, you can just make that adjustment with your finger and very quickly get to the right depth of the cut. So there are different size planes that you can use. So the one that I always like to start with is uh, planes like these, not necessarily wooden ones. You can also have metal ones, but these three all serve the same purpose. These are called scrub planes uh, or jack planes. The scrub planes are the smaller ones. The jack plane is the bigger one, uh, sometimes also called a four plane, uh, F-O-R-E, because it's the plane you use before you use any other plane. The irons on these are cambered, so they are curved irons. So this is the adjustment tool. Thank you. Yep. Um, so for a wooden plane, it's just held in place by friction. So this wooden wedge is held in the body, and then you've got the iron. So there are only three pieces to this plane. So to loosen it, you smack it on the heel, or on a bigger plane, you can smack it on the toe on top, this raised piece here is called a strike button. And the inertia is what loosens it because the plane body moves while the wedge and the iron stay in place. So you just give it a good whack and it loosens it right up. And so the iron, you can see, has this nice curve. And the other thing that you'll notice about this type of plane is that adjust it here and then to tighten it you get it set to about the right depth and then hit the wedge uh, and so you can see it's poking down pretty far but it's coming out and it's curved like this so the other thing about this is you've got about a quarter inch of space between the iron and uh, <clears throat> what's called the throat so this opening is the mouth so that's wide open so that you can take a big cut. So this, these planes are used when you want to remove a lot of material quickly, but they leave that scalloped surface. So if you're cutting across a board, um, you're going you're gonna to have scallops running this way. That will then have to be taken out, but it's the fastest way to remove material. If you try to use a plane like this with a very narrow opening and a flat iron, it's going to take forever. You're going to have to stop and sharpen it several times. So it's just easier to start with a plane like this. So when you're using a plane, I picked this piece of maple because you can see the grain lines are going in this direction. So they're, they're going up the board. So if I were to show you with this chisel, what would happen is if I come along and cut this, it's going to compress those fibers. Whereas if I go in this direction with the grain coming up, the chisel is going to wedge into this board and it's going to become a wedge and it's going to lever that wood up and it's going to break as opposed to this direction. So you get what's called tear out. So I'm going to put this into the vise and show you what it looks like when you get tear out. And sometimes it's hard to it's hard to uh, plan for what the tear out is going to look like or which direction you need to plane because the best way to think of wood is uh, trees are small at the top and big at the bottom so every year it adds girth to the, the tree 
Think of it as a bunch of stacked cones, like traffic cones, just stacked on top of each other. And if that's what you have, how do you cut a three-dimensional shape out of there where all the lines are going perfectly straight? You can't do it. So that's why you always have to think about the way that the wood is cut. So I'm going to, this has a horn in the front, and then I'm just going to put my hand on the back. And as I've gone through this one, it's pretty easy to see that I have just made some big chips in this wood. So effectively that the, the chisel that is the iron has just gone in there and wedged this up and split it out. And that's what tear out is. So the way to combat that is to plane in the correct direction. this little piece underneath just to balance out the vise. So these little box of vices are very handy because you can mount them to any surface with just a pair of clamps. So now I've got it going in the opposite direction. So the grain lines are going up like this. So I'm going to compress the fibers as I push forward. And I'm taking off some pretty thick shavings. So what I'm going to do is Loosen this up, give it a couple wax like that. It's probably too much. Now it's barely poking through, so I didn't like how thick the shavings were coming off of that, so I raised the iron and now I'm taking thinner shavings, so I'm not cutting off nearly as much, and it sounds much better. So now the shavings are this thick instead of this thick. So much more control over it, but I'm removing material very quickly. So once I've got that relatively flat, then I can switch over to something like this, which is a small smoothing plane. Now, before I get to that, what, what I would do is, if it were a long board and I wanted to make it flat along the length, I would choose a long plane. Um, rule of thumb is you can flatten the board that is twice as long as you're playing without a lot of skill, without a lot of effort. Because the flat sole on this plane is going to ride over the, think of it like uh, mountains and valleys. It's going to ride over the mountain tops and it's just going to cut those mountain tops off. So as you go down, you're just taking the mountain tops off more and more and more until you get down to the point where you are just taking a continuous shaving. This is sticking out a little too far. So the nice thing about a wooden plane, if you get comfortable using it, is it is much lighter. And now instead of taking off chunks like this, you take off a continuous shaving. And then if you switch to a smoothing plane, and this gives you a nice smooth surface. So I'm just going to hold this until I start to see that sliver of light come out along the length of the plane. That's a little too thick, so I'm going to back that off. I'm going to go counterclockwise until I feel it just there's a little bit of slop when you do that initially so I'm going to back it off until I don't feel the slop and go about a half turn and then go forward until I don't feel the slop now I'm getting much thinner shavings so the thing about using hand planes is that I said saws are smart planes are dumb because 
they take so much more care to get the right kind of shaving because you can adjust the lateral, you can adjust the depth. And also when you're, when you're going along a board, if you're holding it at an angle, you're going to take off and put an angle on the edge of your board. Uh, there's nothing guaranteeing that this is going to stay flat other than you know, the, the skill of the user because it's very easy here on the end to tilt the plane down and put too much pressure on the base which means you're going to take off a chunk and you're going to end up with a curve. Same thing on the other end, when you do this, you can put too much pressure here and push down too hard and you end up with something that looks like a banana. So the way to combat that is to you have to change the pressure that you apply throughout. So when I do this, I'm not putting any pressure on the back. All the pressure is going on the front because that's resting on the board. If I put pressure on the back, it tilts down. So all the pressure is going on here. When I get into the middle, now I'm equalizing the pressure. I'm pushing down with both hands. And then when I get to the end, I'm just using this to guide, but all the pressure is on the back. So you change as you go through. And it's just something you pick up. Now I'm not cutting right now because the depth is not there. So I'm going to make a slight adjustment to the knob. And now I'm getting much thinner shaving. So I had these shavings earlier. These are much thinner. So by changing that depth, you change the thickness of those shavings, and by using those three planes, you end up with a nice smooth surface that's better than anything sandpaper could give you. So there are different types. I've got some wooden ones here. Uh, this is a jack or four plane. Then you switch to a long joiner plane to flatten it, and then you finish up with a smoothing plane. So those are the three planes that I always have in my tool chest. I always have a jack, a joiner, and a smoother. And it just makes it easy uh, because a lot of times when we're teaching these classes, people they get disheartened when they see just how bad they are at sawing. But then you put it in the vise, and within 30 seconds, you've cleaned it up and you've given them a fresh surface, and just oh, their minds are there. Uh, so these are these are bevel up planes. You also have what's called a low angle plane. Um, this type of plane is very, very important that you do not touch the front knob, uh, especially if you use JB Weld to keep it on. Come on. Uh, <laughs> So here, in the lateral adjustment again. The lateral adjustment is uh, given by the screw, which goes side to side. And it also controls the depth because uh, the plane fits over that knob, and then this little hole in the iron fits onto this little peg. Now, the bed on this, the frog, is much lower. It's at about 12 degrees. So that's why it's called a low angle plane. The way that you use this plane is it's a bevel up. So when you take the 12 degree angle that it's mounted plus about the 30 degree bevel, you get 40 to 45 degrees depending on how accurate the, the iron is. The frogs on these planes are mounted at 45 degrees, but because they're beveled down like this, it doesn't matter how accurate this bevel is, it doesn't matter what it's at, because it's really the top surface which is flat and parallel to the frog that determines the cutting angle. Standard planes are cut, they cut at about 45 degrees. You can get high angle planes that will go up to about 55. The higher the angle, the more control you have over tear out, so you don't have to deal with it as much. So if you have wood that's figured, that has grain that reverses direction, you want to use something with a higher angle because as it, since it reverses direction, you're going to get tear out as it passes over that different type of grain. So mahogany um, is a common one that has what's called spiral grain, where it has stripes that run along the length of it that have different grain direction. Um, a piece like this, oftentimes in maple, um, as the tree grows vertically, it will go in and out, and so when you cut across that, some sections of the grain will be going in this direction, some will be going in that direction, and you can get this striped effect called curl, which is a bare to plane, unless you're using a very sharp iron 
and a high angle plane. Um, and you can use a card scraper to clean that up, but it's, it's one of the more difficult woods to plane. Uh, so a low angle plane, really not much difference. It, some people use them, some don't. Uh, but they've been around for a while and they work, which is why they're still around. Uh, it's just a matter of preference. So those are, these are called bench planes because they sit on your bench and they're, they're kind of your go-to for dimensioning the stock. You can also use uh, something like this, which is a block plane. So the block plane is meant to be held in one hand. You can see it's not that much smaller than the number two. Uh, there is a number one that you can use, uh, the Stanley, that's only five and a half inches long. They are collector's items. The Stanley made 11 uh, sizes of bench planes. The number one is probably worth all the others put together times two because it was such a small plane that nobody could really use it. So they didn't make a lot of them and it's very expensive and very rare. Uh, but a block plane, it, it's a much simpler design. It's easier to use in one hand. You could use the number two in one hand if you wanted, but it's kind of clunky. Uh, whereas a block plane, about the same length, but you can hold it in one hand. So if you needed to, uh, if you wanted to shave the end, the edge of the board, you could even hold the wood like this and then put a chamfer on that edge just using a plane. And, and when you're using it on the edge, you get these little thin strips. Uh, but the plane will leave a sharp edge. So and I've, I've literally cut myself on the edge of the wood after it's been planed, not from the iron, but from the wood. So a couple passes with that just takes the edge off, makes it easier to use. You can also mount this in the vise and use this to flatten if you want. Um, but it's a pretty simple design. It's got a wheel on the bottom to uh, add tension, but it's just a single iron and a, a very simple mount. But very easy to use. Um, this They say this is really good for end grain. Uh, any plane is good for end grain. It's just a matter of how you want to control it or how you want to hold the, the plane or whatever is comfortable. When you're planing the end grain of a board, what that means is you're planing across the, the edge and you can see it's torn up from the saw. Uh, you can easily plane this and clean up the end, but you do have to worry about what's called spelching, which is where the, the wood breaks out. Use this one because I can adjust it easier. So as I take a deeper cut, so it did do a good job of cleaning that up. So this is still pretty rough. This one's nice and smooth. But on the part at the end where I was pushing the plane over the body, this has started to split. And so that end is damaged. You don't want to, you typically want to avoid planing the end grain like that. So what you would do is take uh, another piece of wood and you would put them together in the vise like this so that this other piece of wood, it doesn't have to be angled like this, will support that at the end because trees are very weak when you split them. That's why we split firewood because you drive a wedge down and it splits along those grain lines. So if you have something holding this together, you can plane that and you don't have to worry as much about whether it's going to break. So if you're making cutting boards, it's always worth it to have an extra scrap of wood that you can put against this. You want to make sure that it is not wider than your piece, otherwise the, uh, the vise is going to clamp onto this and this will fall. Uh, but very useful because the end grain looks kind of ugly when it's cut by a saw, but it looks nice when it's been cleaned up by a plane, especially if you're going to put a finish on it. One other plane that you can yeah. use, um, this is called a spoke shave. So in the old days, this was used to shave the spokes of uh, wagon wheels. So it is nothing more than a plane with wings on the side. 
so that you can hold this. And this is a Stanley 151. Um, but it has a couple of pads here for your thumbs. There, your palms rest here. And the iron is mounted the same way that it is mounted in a regular plane, and you can just push this along. So if you mount this in the vise, the nice thing about a spoke shave is it's great for curves. So if you're going to put a curve on a piece of wood, um, a block plane or a bench plane is kind of cumbersome, whereas this will allow you to make a much simpler cut. So when you're using this, same thing with the plane, sometimes you'll see me twist. Uh, it's really a matter, you, you get a feel for doing this because sometimes you start on one side and you move the plane to the side as you cut. Uh, you, there's no real rule for using it, but you start to get a feel for what works and what doesn't. And I'm taking too big a cut there, so I'm going to back it off a little bit with these screws. If you are cutting a flat surface, you really want to have you really want to have this iron coming out evenly, so the same depth on both sides. But I've got this one set so it's a deeper cut here versus here, and that's so that I can make a deeper cut like this, or if I want a lighter cut, all I have to do is physically move this to the other side, and now I've got a thinner cut. So you don't have to stop and adjust it. So if you're making, uh, if you're cutting a curved surface, so let's say I want to put a curve on this here, the wood grain is going from my left to my right as it goes back. So even though it cuts great when I'm doing this way, it tears out when I go this direction. You can hear the difference. And it's a much more ragged cut. So I can turn this around and just pull it towards me. And if I feel like I'm taking too big a cut, I just use the other edge of the spoke shape. is a pretty foolproof way of putting a curve on something. Now I'm going to switch because I'm going in this direction. And this, this really helps illustrate how difficult it is to think in three dimensions and know exactly what you're cutting. Because that the wood grain Again, it's conical as the tree grows, so when you cut that three-dimensional parallel pipe at rectangle, uh, I got parallel pipe in there. I got it. Um, it's going to, it, it's going to feel like it's reversing grain on you throughout. So you, you have to go by feel and take light cuts, and when you feel that it's tearing out, you just make sure you go in the opposite direction. Now, for a, for a board, that has a lot of tear out that you can't avoid, like curly maple, figured cherry. Anytime you you get different uh, directions of grain, it, it's kind of like having a uh, velour couch where you run your hand across and it's dark, and then you drag your fingers back and you get these light streaks. You know, we did that when we were kids, and we had those wonderful couches from the 70s and 80s. Uh, but it was. Uh, you know, that type of material, that, that's called chatoyance, and that is the way that the light reflects off the fibers of the couch or off the grain of the wood. And so you can't, if it changes that quickly, you can't get, you know, sharp fixes just about everything. So if you're having trouble, sharpen the tools and it will clean a lot of that up. Uh, but if you can't, and you have to plane it, and you have tear out, you can use what's called a card scraper. So this is just a piece of spring steel. This is an old saw plate from a panel saw with some broken teeth. So I just cut it into this shape. Uh, so I flattened both sides on a sharpening stone and then flattened the edge. So I have a 90 degree um, edge on this, even though it's curved. It was still 90 degrees to the plate. 
then you take a burnisher, I'm just using a screwdriver to, as an example, but a burnisher is a really hard rod. It's usually uh, 60 Rockwell, so it's, it's harder than even the uh, tool steel that you use on edge cutting tools. But you would just drag this along at a slight angle and you would take that edge and turn over a burr. And so as you drag your finger along this towards the edge, you can feel that burr. So then when you put this in, that burr does not care what direction you're going. It doesn't pay attention to grain. It will just scrape off whatever material you've got and leave you, it'll be a rough surface, but it will get rid of the tear out and it'll do it quickly. If you're refinishing furniture, I had an old desk I had to refinish, I used a card scraper. And I was able to get the entire desk taken, all the old paint taken off very quickly in less than an hour. If I had used a sander or power tools to do it, it would have just taken forever and I would have had paint dust in the air. But I just used a card scraper. And if you've got a card scraper, you have four surfaces. You've got this edge, this edge, this one, and this one. And so you, you turn a burr on all of them, and then as you go, it, the burr doesn't last very long. But as you go, you're just finding new surfaces uh, along this point to get that shaving off. And if you are pushing the card scraper, and you get a nice shaving, you know it's sharp. If all you get is dust, sawdust, that's an indication that you need to turn a new burr. You can also drag it if you want. And that'll get rid of tear out, and then you can just switch to sandpaper and sand it smooth. Uh, but it's much faster than any other method. I think that's it. Anything, anything, anything else in chisels or anything? Um, so, this is a chisel. It cuts. Okay, so nice. <laughs> <laughs> That's all, folks. That's it.